miraculously, like the two guys that were supposed to show up like 40 minutes ago, just like wander along and, uh, and we, they end up helping us and we get it in. It, so they did like two minutes of work, but it was good because I don't think we could have gotten it done. So I'm actually like a little bit sore today from, uh, manhandling an oak workbench yesterday, but we got it done. So that's my story of Sunday morning. Anyway, <clears throat> happy Monday <laughs> at eight in the morning. Uh, Kit, any uh, homework questions? Yes, sir. Can we go over 49? 49, sure. 49, 2.5, correct? Okay, so this is asking us to determine basically what are the horizontal asymptotes of this thing. So we're looking at 49, <clears throat> and we have f of x is equal to the cube root of um, x to the sixth plus 8 divided by uh, 4x squared plus the square root of 3x to the fourth plus 1. All right. And we want to find the limit as x goes to infinity and the limit as x goes to Minus infinity. Okay, so um, first of all, with most problems like this, the limit as x goes to infinity and the limit as x goes to negative infinity are going to be the same thing. Okay, so we don't need to necessarily go through both of those processes if we can kind of see that, oh, it's going to sort of kind of be the same. All right, so let's take a look at the limit as x goes to infinity of this guy. So first of all, on top, we get cube root x to the six plus eight. And on bottom, I have four x squared plus the square root of three x to the fourth plus one. Okay, so typically if this were like a rational function, in other words, like a polynomial divided by a polynomial, what I'd probably do is just ask, what's the highest power of x on the top and bottom? And in this case, it's kind of like, well, that's a little bit harder to say, but at least we could kind of say it's kind of sort of this. And so like up here, I'm taking the cube root of x to the sixth plus some other stuff. But what is sort of the cube root of x to the sixth? what would that be in terms of powers of x? x squared. Yeah, x squared. So the top is sort of like an x squared. Everybody agree? It's, it's not exactly, but it's good enough for us. On the bottom, we have an x squared here, and what's the square root of x to the fourth? Also an x squared. So it's kind of like we have an x squared-ish thing on top, and we have an x squared-ish thing on the bottom. And so let's divide the top and the bottom of this uh, fraction by x squared. Okay, if I, do, I get the limit as x goes to infinity of the cube root of x to the sixth plus eight divided by x squared divided by four x squared plus the square root of 3x to the fourth plus 1 divided by x squared. Okay, and the reason I'm doing this is I'm <clears throat> going to try to simplify this into something that I can actually take the limit of. Up here, of course, I can always plug in infinity, right? But then I get infinity on top and infinity on the bottom, and that's not so great, right? So what do we do? Now what I could do is I could say I have a cube root on the top. I could write x squared as a cube root, 
but instead of having being x squared, it would be the cube root of x to the sixth. So in other words, I could pull that x squared inside this cube root, and that's fine. So let's do that. Uh, so I'm going to write this as the limit, x going to infinity. On top, I'm going to have the cube root. Now I'm going to write it over the top and the bottom. And it's x to the 6 plus 8 divided by x to the 6th. Because, of course, the cube root of x to the 6th is just x squared. On the bottom, uh, I don't need to, I have an x squared over an x squared here. I could break this up into two fractions. So I'd get 4x squared over x squared. So 4x squared divided by x squared. Plus, now I could do kind of the same trick. I could write this all as one fraction, but the x squared could be under the square root, and then it would be an x to the fourth. So I could write this as the square root of 3x to the 4th plus 1 divided by x to the 4th. Okay, now we can simplify this fraction a little bit, this fraction a little bit, this fraction a little bit. If I do, I get the limit x goes to infinity. On top, I still have this cube root, but inside of the cube root, I could break this into two fractions, and I'd get x to the 6th divided by x to the 6th, which is also known as 1. And then I get plus 8 over x to the 6th, plus 8 over x to the 6th, divided by on bottom, I have 4x squared over x squared. The x squareds cancel, and I just get 4. And then I get plus the square root of, I have 3x to the 4th divided by x to the 4th. That's just 3. And then I have 1 over x to the 4th. So plus 1 over x to the 4th. <coughs> And now everything is in a form where I can go ahead and take the limit as x goes to infinity. Because if x is on the bottom and I have a constant on the top, what happens is the bottom here gets really big. What happens to like 8 over very big number? It gets very small or it goes to 0, right? So this thing, as x gets big, this guy goes to 0 and one over humongous number also goes to zero and we're left with the cube root of one divided by four plus the square root of three right which is one over four plus the square root of three and for all of you who hate life unless you rationalize the denominator. We could do that if you want to. And if, if you wanted to, you multiply top and bottom by 4 minus root 3, if you want to. And you get a, a 4 minus square root of 3 on top. And on bottom, what would that be? So you get 16 uh, minus 3. So 4 minus root 3 divided by 13 would do it. If you, <coughs> if you stopped right here, I'd be fine. Okay. Um, now, when you look up here, it's interesting because I kind of could see it, right? Because up here I could say, all right, well, the highest power of X on top and bottom is basically a square, correct? Because on top it's like a cube root of an X to the sixth, with his, which is an X squared. Here's an X squared. Here's a square root of three X to the fourth, which is an X squared. 
So what's out in front of each of those? Well, there's a one, a cube root of one, which is one. There's a four out in front of the x squared, so a four. And there's a square root of three in front of the x squared, so to speak, and we get the square root of three. So you could kind of see it, but if you wanted to do it like the official way and do, make sure you're doing everything right, this is what is actually happening when you take that limit. So just like in other, we're learning tricks, right? Where we can say, okay, if the power of X, highest power of X on top and bottom is the same, just take the coefficient out in front, right? I talked about that in the lecture. Uh, and that's true, but why is it the thing out in front? Because we go through this big process and come out with the things that are the coefficients that are in front of the highest power of X. It's not just like, oh, that's just the answer. You really are going through this whole process, but that's just a shortcut to get you to the answer. Okay, does that uh, feel good about that answer? And if you did it with minus infinity, where do we actually take the limit? This is why I say you don't need to do it twice because the only thing that changes if X is going to negative infinity happens when we get here and we say, okay, what happens is X gets really really negative well eight over something what this one's even positive now that obviously goes to zero one over something really really big also goes to zero and you end up with the exact same thing so that actually happens most of the time especially when you've got these like uh highest power of x problems it going to positive infinity or negative infinity doesn't really matter it takes kind of a special function before it's different going in the two directions. So any rational function or something that's like this, you really only need to take the limit as X goes to infinity and then ask yourself, does anything really change if we go to negative infinity? And if it doesn't, then you don't need to go through it. Again. Yes, sir. Uh, 23. 23. Okay, 23, we have the limit as x goes to infin negative infinity, limit as x goes to minus infinity of negative 3x to the 16th, negative 3x to the 16th plus 2. Okay. So this one, um, basically they're just saying, okay, well, what happens if you plug in? <clears throat> Here's an interesting thing. You never plug in infinity. Okay. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And maybe we could have a conversation about why can't you plug in infinity? But what you really are doing is you're plugging in a number that's really, really big and negative, right? I, I don't know if you can say it's close to negative infinity because there's no such thing, but if you plug in a really, really large negative number, what's happening? So if I plug in a really, really large negative number and I raise it to the 16th, well, it becomes positive, right? And it's even bigger. So this is a huge positive number right? Times negative three. So now it's a huge negative number. And then I add two. Two isn't going to move the needle very much, right? So it's still a huge negative number. So this is just minus infinity. Yeah. Well, what if it was uh, like negative Yeah, yeah, it, so if it were to the third, like this, then the negative infinity cubed would still be negative infinity. Times negative three would be positive infinity plus two, still positive infinity, so yes. So if it were to the third, and in fact, into any odd power, this would stay, this would be positive infinity, but since it's to a 
even its negative. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, I guess I never answered the question really on this one because doesn't it ask for uh, the horizontal asymptotes? But uh, just in case there's any question about that, what is the horizontal asymptote on this problem? Yeah, y equals this thing, right? Or minus. And that's the horizontal asymptote, right? So, um, and, and if you're asked for a horizontal asymptote, you do need to say it this way. It's not enough if they ask for a horizontal asymptote just to say this. This is something that I've gotten on an exam before where I ask for a horizontal asymptote and somebody just gives this. And that's not quite good enough because a horizontal asymptote is actually the equation of a line. Right, and this is an equation of a line. This is just a number. So if they do ask for a horizontal asymptote, make sure to say y equals, yeah. Oh, could you put y equals this? Yes. Yeah, that would be fine. Yes, sir. Uh, is 21 just like 23 over there? 21. Yeah, it's very similar. So you're going to infinity. Right? Oh, huh. yeah, that's fun. So, um, like, on that one, you always have to be a little bit careful with infinity. So let's just do it real quick. Um, 21 is the limit as x goes to infinity. Of 3x to the 12th. Minus 9x to the 7. Now, our first instinct could potentially be wrong. And that is, well, let's just plug in infinity. Right? And if you do, you get 3 times, well, infinity to the 12th, I suppose, is infinity. So you get 3 times infinity, which is infinity minus uh, infinity to the seventh, I suppose is infinity, times nine is infinity, so you get infinity minus infinity. And what you don't want to say at this point is that that is zero. That would be not so great. And I don't remember if I talked about this at all in the little lecture I gave, but the idea of infinity minus infinity, do I talk about that a little bit, where it could be equal to seven, or it could be equal to anything, right? So infinity minus infinity is what we call an indeterminate form. So you don't really know what that is. So you need to do something a little bit different to evaluate this than just plug into, plug in the infinity and sort of hope for the best. So what we could do though, is we could factor out as many of the X's as we can. And maybe that would give us a better picture. So we could write this as the limit as X goes to infinity of 3x to the seventh times, and then what would be left? Uh, I suppose this would be x to the fifth minus 3. And I feel like, okay, now this is more like it, because if I plug in infinity here, I get infinity. And if I plug in infinity here, I get infinity minus 3, which is infinity. So I get infinity times infinity, which is infinity. So everything's fine here because I get an infinity times infinity, uh, which is not an indeterminate form. I can go ahead and evaluate that. The other way to think about this, though, that makes a lot of sense is in the grand scheme of things, which grows faster? X to the 12th, does that get big faster? Or does x to the seventh get big faster? And the x to the twelfth like wins by a long run over time, right? As x's get big, x to the twelfth is much, much bigger than x to the seventh. 
And so this thing just uh, outpaces this. And so this still gets big, even though you're kind of subtracting off a very big number. This one's always much, much bigger. So it goes to infinity. Make sense? Yes, sir. So there are two uh, variables in the problem. Mm -hmm. Because the, the other one that you did, it was just kind of like, oh, this looks like, and this looks like. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't work for this, right? Because there's two x's. Um, like over here, what it looks uh, like, you mean? Or yeah, for twenty three, it was like the yeah. x to the sixteen um, goes positive, and then it's multiplied by negative, so it goes negative, and then it's added to, so it's still negative. But that right. would work for the other one, right? Um, like for this one, yeah. Yeah, you can't, uh, if it has X's in both, then you need to just be a little bit more careful. Hopefully, like in this case, we could factor something out and make it into something that isn't um, infinity minus infinity. But what you can be sure of is if you ever plug in infinity and you get infinity minus infinity, that's bad. Like you should do something else. That doesn't mean you can't evaluate it like we just did. It's infinity. But you can't evaluate it by saying, well, it's infinity minus infinity. Because you would have never probably said, well, infinity minus infinity is obviously infinity. Right? That doesn't make any sense. So, uh, yeah, just be aware that that form is no good. And it, you usually can't get anything good out of it. Yeah. Can you tell us how this solves for the x Yes. That's right. That's right. Because this one would so to speak win as it grew, right? This one's going to be much, much bigger than this one. So if this one was negative, this one was positive, then the negative one would win and it would be negative infinity. That's right. Yes, sir. Uh, 17. 17. So 17, we have the limit as theta goes to infinity. Of cosine of theta divided by theta squared. Okay, so question is what to do here. If I plug in infinity, so to speak, it's not so great. And why is that? Well, the bottom's fine, I suppose. If I plug in infinity to the bottom, it's just infinity. What happens on the top? Yeah, cosine's not really do, going anywhere, right? Cosine's doing this sort of thing. So it, but what do you know about cosine? Yeah. That's right. It has to be in between one and negative one, right? And we've talked about like the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem in one of the lectures. So what I could do here to help myself is I could say, that I know that cosine of theta, at its very biggest, it's one. And at its very smallest, it's negative one. So what I could say is that I know that negative one over theta squared, I could take the limit if I wanted to as theta goes to infinity, that's always going to be smaller than the limit as theta goes to infinity of cosine of theta over theta squared. And that's always going to be less than or equal to the limit as theta goes to infinity of 1 over theta squared. Because I know that cosine is always greater than or equal to negative 1, and it's always less than or equal to 1. 
correct? So what is this limit right here? What's the limit as theta goes to infinity of negative one over theta squared? Well, if I plug in theta at this point, the bottom just gets huge. And what's anything over humongous? Zero, that's right. So this side is just zero. So zero is less than or equal to the limit as theta goes to infinity of cosine of theta over theta squared is less than or equal to, well, what's this limit then? Yeah, the bottom is getting huge. One over humongous is zero. So I don't exactly know what this limit is, but I know it's between zero and zero, right? So it must be zero. So the limit as theta goes to infinity of cosine of theta divided by theta squared has to be zero by the squeeze theta. Does that make sense? This is a common trick that comes up in mathematics a lot, especially in calculus with like sines and cosines is whenever you come up against a sine or a cosine and you're kind of like, I don't really know what to do with that guy because he doesn't really go anywhere, especially as state is going to infinity or something. It's like, this isn't really going anywhere. Well, it's like, that's a great time to say, but is it bounded? So can you say something's always bigger than cosine? Something's always smaller than cosine. And now, like in this case, the squeeze theorem is perfect, but that's just a good uh, trick in general. It's like, well, we always, cosine always is smaller than one and it's always bigger than negative one. So does that help us? Okay. So a good trick to keep in mind in the future. Yes. Can you do 19 as well? Sure. 19, we have limit as x goes to infinity. So 19, we have limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of x to the fifth divided by the square root of x. Yeah, okay, so if we, again, plug in infinity here. Infinity to the fifth is still infinity, and cosine of infinity is a mass, right? It still is just like going up and down between negative one and one. On the bottom, this thing is just going to infinity. So this thing, ultimately what you need to do is exactly what I did over here with the squeeze theorem, but what I can tell you right now is like, it's zero. Because what's happening is this thing is always relatively small. Like it's between negative one and one. This thing, square root of infinity, so to speak, is humongous, right? This eventually gets very, very big. This thing remains relatively small. So small over big goes to zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you really want to show it the right way, you'd go through this exact same argument. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Would it always be zero with cosine on top? If there's something on the bottom that's growing to infinity, yes. If this thing was also like a cosine or something on the bottom, then no. Do you know what I mean? So if you have like a cosine, something that's bounded between, let's say, negative one and one on the top, and something that's growing without bound on the bottom. The thing on the bottom is going to win. It's going to push everything to zero. But if the thing on the bottom wasn't growing to infinity, then that all bets are off, and it could do something else. So you just have to... Uh, that, that's kind of how you should kind of think about it when you're approaching a problem like this is it's kind of like there's the actual way to do it 
but there's the way you should be thinking about it. And that is that like, this doesn't get very big, this gets huge. So this one wins. So it's going to go to zero. Right. Uh, but if you have this one doesn't get very big, this one also doesn't get very big. Then it's like, okay, I guess I have to think about this a little bit and see where is it going to end up. Yeah. Other questions? Did that answer your question, by the way? Okay. Let's see. Some people said something online here. 19. I did that one. 35. Did I do 35? No. Okay, so this one I have. Oh, but 35 is very similar itself in that uh, on 35, you have a sine X on the top. Again, sine X bounded, right, between negative 1 and 1. And then you have E to the X on the bottom. But E to the X gets big really fast, right? So uh, E to the X goes to infinity. So you have something that's bounded over infinity. So it must be zero. So same, similar reasoning on 35, you're going to get zero. Let's see. Somebody said 17, which I did. 23, which I also, I don't know if I did 23. Yeah, I did. Okay, perfect. Somebody said 31. I don't think I did 31. So let's look at that one. Okay, so number 31 is the limit. This x goes to negative infinity of the square root of 16x squared plus x divided by x. So there are a couple ways that I could deal with this one. Um, the top the highest power of x inside the square root is x squared. And if I square rooted an x squared, it would be sort of kind of an x. So it's kind of like I have an x on top and an x on bottom. And so I could divide the top and bottom by x, and that's one way to go. The other way to go is to just include this x inside of this square root, which would make it an x squared. I think that one's easier. Um, so I could rewrite this as the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the square root of 16x squared plus x over x squared. So I just took this x and included it in the square root as an x squared. Okay, so this is the limit as x goes to minus infinity of um, the square root. So I get 16x squared divided by x squared. So if I break these into two fractions, I get just 16. And then I get plus x over x squared, which is also known as 1 over x. And now I can take the limit as x goes to minus infinity. And 1 over minus infinity is going to zero. So I'm just left with the square root of 16, which is otherwise known as four. Sound good? Other questions? Yes. Off of that one, does it matter since it's a square root if you do plus or minus four? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. So let's do this. Let me write this. X squared equals 16. Okay. Um, if X squared equals 16, what is X? Yeah, we would say it's plus or minus. Well, really what we would do is we take the square root of both sides, correct? 
And when we take the square root of both sides, we say that X is equal to plus or minus the square root of 16. So this means something, and that is that there's a plus square root of 16, and there's a minus square root of 16. But the square root of 16, and this is actually something that many people don't really realize, is that when I write the square root of 16, it's always the positive one. If I want the negative one, then I'd write negative square root of 16. And then it would be minus four, right? So, and the way, this isn't really a proof, so to speak, but it's some rationale. If you type in the square root of 16 to your calculator, it won't say plus or minus four. It will say four. Because the when you use this notation square root of 16, what you're saying is the positive square root of this thing. But what comes across is because we're used to this problem, if we have X squared equals 16, then I totally agree with you that the answer is plus or minus four. But if I say the square root of 16, then that's four. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So That's right. Even at the very beginning, when they say the square root of all this nonsense, they're saying the positive square root of all that nonsense, right? Not the negative square root. So there aren't two answers to this. There's just one. And it would also be very confusing sometimes if you did mean both, because like, let's say that I even said that f of x is a function is the square root of x. Well, are you saying that this is two functions? Or no, no, what you mean is plug in x and whatever its square root is, right? Not the negative one, too. Or else that wouldn't actually be a function. So we need a notation like that that only does the positive one. And that is what we call that, like, radical sign. is the positive square root function. Yeah, that's a good question. 33? Sure. Let's see. Okay. So 33, we have the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared uh, minus square root of x to the fourth plus x, uh, I'm sorry, plus 3x squared. Okay, this is an interesting one. Um, because of what happens if you kind of evaluate it at infinity, because you get infinity minus infinity, right? So if you were to just plug in infinity, you get infinity minus, and then inside this would be infinity. Infinity minus infinity, we said that's bad. So that's not what we should do, is just plug in infinity. But then we might say, okay, let's just kind of evaluate the powers of x and see which would win the race. And this is kind of like an x squared. This is kind of like a square root of x to the fourth. It's like, okay, so it kind of seems that like that's kind of equal to. So what's it going to be? Well, what we can do, and they give you a hint, right, is that we could multiply the top and bottom of this thing by its, uh, what do we call that, when we switch this sign? The conjugate. That's right, very good. So we say that this is times uh, x squared plus the square root of x to the fourth plus 3x squared, and do the same thing on the bottom of the fraction. So we could put this over 1, say, times x squared plus square root of x to the fourth plus 3x squared. And we didn't really do anything bad here because we're just multiplying this thing by 1. Right? So that's fine. So we can rewrite. This is the limit 
x goes to infinity of, okay, if I multiply out the top, I get x squared times x squared, which is x to the fourth. Then I get x squared times that square root, right? So I get plus x squared, square root, x to the fourth, plus 3x squared. Then I get minus the square root times x squared. So I get minus x squared, square root, x to the fourth, plus 3x squared. And then I get the minus square root times the positive square root, which is minus what's inside x to the fourth plus three squared all over uh, what's on the bottom here x squared plus the square root of x to the fourth plus three x squared okay so and now wonderful things start to happen uh, on top i've got the x squared times this square root minus x squared times that square root so those are just negatives of each other so they cancel then I have x to the fourth minus x to the fourth. So on top, the x to the fourth cancels with the negative x to the fourth. And all that I'm left with is the limit as x goes to infinity of negative 3x squared on top. And on the bottom, I have x squared plus the square root of x to the fourth plus three X squared. Now this is a problem very much like what we've been doing in other parts of the section. So now I say, oh, okay, on top, the highest power of X is an X squared. On bottom, the highest power of X is basically an X squared. So I could divide the top and the bottom of each of these by X squared. Okay, if I did, then I'd get the following. Limit as x goes to infinity of negative 3x squared over x squared. And then on the bottom, I have x squared over x squared. And I have this thing over x squared. But I'm going to write the x squared inside of the square root. So I get plus the square root of x to the fourth plus 3x squared over x to the fourth because I wrote it inside the square root. Okay, let's come up here. Um, so that gives me limit x goes to infinity. On top, now I just have negative three. On bottom, I have a one plus uh, okay, I guess I need to do a little bit more work here. This is the square root of x to the fourth over x to the fourth, otherwise known as one, and then plus three x squared over x to the fourth, which is three over x squared. And now I can take the limit as x goes to infinity, which just makes three over x squared very small and go to zero. So I'm just left with the limit x goes to infinity of negative 3 on top, and on bottom I get 1 plus square root of 1, which is 1, or negative 3 over 2. Now that's interesting, because I basically got this, I started with this problem where I had like infinity minus infinity, and what I said is if you just keep on plugging in bigger and bigger values of x to this thing, that eventually you'll get close to negative 3 over 2. That's sort of remarkable, actually, uh, that that's true. Um, so that's kind of cool. Any other questions? Has anybody solved the riddle yet? Boo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Can I ask if I'm like on the right track? You can ask. Okay. So first what we would do is you have 12, right? Yes. So I would weigh four pills and four pills. Uh -huh. If it were different, then we know the poison is in one of them. Yes. If they're not, then the poison is in the other one. So let's say that the poison is one of the eight. Yes. Okay. that's going to be one. So we'll put that four off to the side. 
And the organ which, weighs which four? The four that we know are poison. Which four do you know are poison? Uh, the four that didn't weigh different. Okay, so if it weighs different, mm -hmm. then would you agree that either it's a heavy poison over here mm -hmm. or it's a light poison over here? Yeah, so all the things we didn't weigh. So yeah. we know that those are not poison, right? I thought we were looking for the antidote and the rest of the poison. Oh, no. Uh, other way around. Uh, you, we are looking for the antidote and the rest of Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that take four of the pills that aren't the one we're looking for mm -hmm. and set them aside. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm with you. So no, we know these ones aren't the ones we want. Yeah. But we also know that they all weigh the same. So we're going to weigh those against the four here. Is that kind of the right idea? Okay, we could do that, and then we would find out if we were dealing with a heavy pill or a light pill, correct? Yes, or which four it's in. Yeah, and then you just have one more way, and you have four pills. Mm -hmm. That's difficult. Mm -hmm. So not quite, but you are, you're thinking the right way. You're definitely thinking the right way, but that's not quite it, but good try. Yeah, keep thinking about it. Um, I, I guarantee you it's a rewarding problem to solve. Okay, we just have a couple more minutes. Any other questions that I can answer? By the way, in terms of, oh, oh yes, sir. 27, let me take a quick look. Let's see if it's, oh yeah. So on 27, the power of X on top is bigger than the power of X on the bottom, right? So it's either going to go, no, it's, so the top is going to get a lot bigger than the bottom. So it's either going to go to positive or negative infinity. And so you have to kind of plug in, let's see, we're plugging in negative infinity, but then it's squared. So on top it's squared, which means it's going, the top is going to positive infinity. Uh, let's see, the bottom would be going to negative infinity. So this thing is probably going to negative infinity. Does that make sense? Because the top is getting really big and the bottom is getting a little bit big. Uh, so it just goes off to either positive or negative infinity, depending on what you, you're plugging in. And in this case, negative infinity. Okay, uh, in terms of upcoming homework, I updated the next homework set and put in some pictures again for uh, what the homework set actually is. Um, so what I would recommend right now, I think I'm going to try to get about a week ahead on homework assignments in terms of them being the correct thing posted in Foxtail, but don't work way ahead right now. Because if you work like two weeks ahead, you're going to be doing problems out of the, the yellow book and we're not using that anymore. OK, so just make sure that if you're doing homework assignments and you're trying to work ahead a little bit or something, that you're actually doing problems that are posted in pictures on Foxtail or you're doing the wrong thing. OK, I just want to make sure everything will be posted on Foxtail from now on. Um, any other questions about that? OK, great. Uh, well, have a wonderful day then and I will see you on Wednesday. Yes. About 27. Yeah, because the top is going to infinity, right? The bottom is going to negative infinity. But isn't X itself is going to negative infinity, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's basically you're getting negative infinity plus one. Okay. So that's a negative number. Yeah. And then on top, it's going to be a very big positive number. So a very big positive number over a little negative number is still going to be negative. Yeah.